Please welcome film producer and director Jenna Cannell. She will introduce her new film. Hey everybody, I'm Jenna Cannell and I put together the video that you are about to watch. My connection to this video is not only that I'm a filmmaker, but also that I am a sibling to someone with physical and neurological differences. I really found out when conducting these interviews via Zoom with students and educators and industry professionals and family members and people who have been touched by the STEM fields and the disability community and the massive intersection of the two. Something that I learned in making this video, it's hard to sometimes assume that children are as smart and as curious as they naturally are. So often, abilities and learning differences get left out of the intersectional inclusivity conversation. I was inspired making this by the young people who are passionate about this stuff. Talking to a young girl about her passion for science, she's gonna go and create the next vaccine that's gonna keep us all safe. I was inspired by the educators who don't let this new way of teaching and connecting stop them. You, the people watching this, are finding new ways to connect. The way that we connect has certainly changed, but our need for connection and our ability to connect have not. Thank you so much for everything that you do in the classroom and in the world around you. Please stay healthy. STEMI, Innovation for Inclusion in Early Education, the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute at UNC, the University of Denver Moorgridge College of Education, the Morisco Institute of Early Learning, and the U.S. Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs, Ideas That Work, presents a new short film by Jenna Cannell. Try again. So you said you wanted to play Haya. Yeah. See. <laughs> like here. Yeah. Do you want to learn how to strum? Yeah. So that's what you like to do, right? Yeah. So I do like this. It's something that isn't really talked too much about in early childhood special education, but it's so important to look at how we can integrate STEM into early childhood. To be honest, the um, first time I hear it, it's STEM in, in uh, like elementary school and middle school, but in early head start or early, head, uh, early education, I never heard about it. So I don't think in uh, early childhood uh, there's a good uh, understanding about implementing uh, STEM. There's not a whole lot of training for educators even today on what inclusion STEM One of my teachers, she offered doing a robotics one, but the, like, the school denied it. So if she did that, then yes, a lot of uh, my friends would have started going to STEM. I know a lot of parents who like whose kids are very much interested, but I mean, we ourselves, we had that issue when he was interested, but we couldn't really take the time out and go do it all. I used to think I was not good at math. A lot of people told me that math is really hard for people with Down syndrome, and I believe that. For blind kids, a lot of the world is hearsay. You hear about the Batmobile, about the Millennium Falcon, or about a car. Like, nah, I can't do that. That's for sighted kids. Learning how to adapt and how to not compare myself to how other people are doing. I got a lot of resistance from the teachers saying they can't engage in STEM. They're not going to experiment with things. And you can't blame the school because the schooling system is overwhelmed. You can't blame the parents because parents are trying their best. So, because they have, there's so much that they have to do in a relatively short period of time. Sometimes. The system's not set up to have them just explore something of interest. The children with disabilities who don't really have a lot of opportunities to explore their interests or really problem solve or, you know, engage with materials that are more open-ended. You know, kids are kind of, I've seen that they kind of get averse to it because they're like, that's too much of work on my end. They are not exposed to the fun that you could get out of it. It's important that we don't reserve STEM learning for certain kinds of kids. Technology plays a big part in my ability to make up for my, my physical disability. And that model of education really let me grow and 
figure out where I want to be. If you have goals that look at literacy, and if you have goals that look at, you know, developing, you know, friendships or social interactions, this actually can really be a very powerful vehicle. A lot of the kids with disabilities are, are visual learners like me, so STEM is perfect. They always active, they want to move, <laughs> discover, and science in everywhere. When we go outside, we are, like they learn about science, like seasons and the, how the, the, the trees, like leaves are changing colors and watching the animals. Uh, temperature, there's the five cents, games, or play. Yellow is red with orange. So this also uh, science makes colors together to get another color, like a magic. <laughs> I make space for their experience and let it exist within the curriculum, not as a separate part. When I taught, that was very much true for me, that I wanted it to the activities we did to be relevant to kids' interests in their home lives. One of my favorites are Legos. Guess what? 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 Caddy virus. <gasps> oh. Caddy virus? Oh, we have no. to go cat warranting now? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Legos are nice because they give a little bit of the kind of fine motor practice and enable us to kind of talk about it and use some of the language that I want her to positional words and prepositions. With the understanding of how her hearing works, and like trying to explain to her about sound waves and about, you know, how for her it's being processed by a machine. And she can then explain that to her peers that, you know, she wears these to hear. It's so critical for all children, whether they have disabilities or not, to be able to explore and create and really think about how they make meaning and how they learn. You get historical context, you get scientific context, and I think you also get social context. One of the biggest lessons is teamwork. Alex learns from all the other kids. All the kids and the teachers even learn a lot from Alex, too. Yeah, I mean, she has bilateral cochlear implants. So for her language development, it was really important for her to be around a lot of kids that were really talkative. We can raise the expectations, you know, for the kids with disabilities. Mix around with the special needs kids and help them around. Yeah. Kind of not making them feel like they are different or you're different. You know, that, that whole thing, they were trying to break up that barrier. Because tomorrow when they go to work, you are going to see these kind of people working with you. It teaches everyone to work together and solve problems together. Incorporating STEM was really this vehicle that drove this social emotional development. It really empowered me that I would be able to, you know, keep up with and then get me all shit. He came home after school and he would just talk nonstop. I almost reverse engineered the lesson. So at the end I said, Everything you did is the quality of a good scientist. And they're like, I'm already a scientist. When something's like just difficult enough for us to want to keep trying until we get it, keep working on it. Ah. Same goes for emotional regulation. A lot of kids with disabilities are going to have to endure a little more frustration achieving things sometimes. Ah. But what can you say? Okay. Because I think this was presented as part of the natural process of creating solutions. How little frustration we saw across the board was pretty shocking. If I mess up, just keep trying. It's okay if something breaks, we learn. It's okay if uh, something doesn't work that we think will. We're gonna try something new. Uh oh, I'm scared. Yeah, what happens if your bridge breaks? Build it again. You build it again. That's right. You keep trying. One of my students made a big error and she screamed. She was like, Diana, get over here. Look, look, look. I failed and it's awesome. Uh-oh, I knocked the Lego over. What should I do? I can't pick it up. I can't pick it up. And everyone stopped and we all ran over to see and we were like, that is so cool. Can you see it? Ow. You bonk your head a little yeah. bit. I like how you just laughed at all. <laughs> that was a bomb. <laughs> hey, this month for laughing it off. <laughs> you can't decide whether you're upset yeah. or not. <laughs> and then we all high fived. We're like, yes to failure. Woo! <laughs> the time that I feel the most, you know, empowered is competing when I'm able to achieve a task or a challenge. 
He just needed a little bit of extra TLC and some social thinking just to get him through some communication. Beginnings of leadership and these beginnings of creating a child with a very solid self-esteem. It has to be a cultural change. Sometimes as early childhood, teachers and parents and caregivers, like we try to make things too easy for kids and we don't want them to be frustrated. But learning to tolerate a little bit of it is really good for them. Even with very young people, I found that they're quite capable. The name in the game is presumption of competence. I want all of my teachers to know that I have only one disability, but I have many, many amazing abilities. Because of those teachers that he had, he's going to become the next CEO of a great business. And with those teachers, they should earn more money because of that. A big part of my getting into technology was being pushed. They were always like, no, yeah, you got it, keep going. We're not afraid to ask me what I need. It's okay. You know, we can try different things. If it doesn't work, we'll try something else. And, you know, so that's how we've been able to do it, like with that honest, trusting relationship with the school district. Sending the kids home with the more papers than they should have. That's one thing. <laughs> that's one thing. He, he's saying that because he's got a ton of homework right now to do, so that's why. <laughs> there are going to be challenges, but I can meet them. I was really proud of myself. Her fixing like, stuff. Because something I made. Her language expanded exponentially. When I started learning about the neuro differences of my own child is when I kind of became into an understanding of my own neuro differences. We've been able to develop our skill sets and also find sustainable paid employment for these guys. I applied to nine colleges and got into eight. I am in Scotland and to at my shot. I thought I could be an engineer. It's a debate between mechanical and biomedical. I can speak, read, and write in two languages. I can solve complex or problems in math. And also, I'm proud that I'm such a nice kid. And be a teacher. I'm probably going to be a vet. As long as I'm working with technology, I'll be happy. What you do right now is actually you know, it's almost like deciding a direction for this particular child. You know, that's a big responsibility, you know. It starts now, and it starts in early childhood. The young lady starts dying no more of an impact it will have. It really, truly starts from the beginning. Because all kids can learn. Help people understand how amazing these neurodifferent human beings are and what they're capable of. You don't know what you're good at until you try it. When you fail, never give up. I can do whatever I put my mind to. How about you, Alex? Are you good? I'm good. You're good? Okay.